All right, guys, chapter 14, I'm going to do in one whole video. Um, this chapter focuses on biotechnology and genomics. And uh, again, this chapter is kind of like a just a array of, of information. There's no really sequential order or like a storyline. It's just like, hey, there's this biotechnology. Hey, there's this, there's this, there's this, there's this. There's a lot of different biotechnologies out there. So we're going to go through a lot of them. Um, and again, this chapter is, is, is just a lot of information from everywhere. All right, that being said, uh, the genome, this is your complete set of genetic material in an organism. This is the first nucleotide on the first chromosome to the last nucleotide on the last chromosome. Uh, remember that, again, we have about 3.2 billion letters in our genome, but it's specific to the species. As you can see here, um, each species is different. 3.2 is, is, isn't by far the, the largest. Uh, you can see there's plants that have a lot more than us. Um, and only 2% of our genome is protein producing, which means it produces a protein. Um, the other 98% regulate that 2%. So when we were first looking at this, we called this junk DNA, and it's not junk. I remember learning this in high school. It was junk DNA. It's not. It's, it's really important to regulating this 2%. Uh, each human in those 3.2 billion uh, letters has uh, about 20 to 25,000 genes, and it's specific to the individual. Um, but yeah, that's that's. we originally thought that we had a lot more, but turns out we don't. The Human Genome Project, this is this is something you have to take notes on, but I originally took about 13 years um, back in the 90s. You can, again, remember the uh, computers back then, or you I understand, you don't remember. I remember. Those computers were really, really old, um, and uh, they just did not function as fast as your like cell phones. Your cell phones are like, hundreds of times faster than those computers were. So it just took a lot of time to sequence these uh, uh, genomes. And um, well, our technology on this just wasn't as intricate as it is today. So sorry about the announcement, um, but the uh, the cost of it was about two point seven billion dollars, um, and that was a lot of money. Was, uh, many countries went to this, many um, uh, companies went to this. So the first genome was, a, I think, a French person, and it took again thirteen years. Now, see, or the scientists can or sequence a genome in less than twenty four hours for less than a thousand dollars because the the uh, cost of it has just dramatically dropped over the years. Again, one thing I wanted you guys to understand is the uh, size of the gen genome doesn't really mean anything to the organism, under meaning that it's not like the more uh, genes you have or the more uh, nucleotides you have, the more complex you are. We have about the same number of genes as like a chicken. We actually have less than a mouse. Um, that's the genes. And then our genome size is comparable to that of a mouse. So it's not about complexity. It's just how that species has evolved throughout the years. And you can see each of these chromosomes has a different number of base pairs, which kind of correlates the number of genes. You can see as it goes down, we see this downward progression as well of the genes and base pairs, except for 11 and 12 for some reason. There are partial sequencing companies. I, uh, in class, will show you 23andMe. I had mine done a couple years ago, and uh, it shows you a lot of information, but doesn't give you the whole, uh, kind of your whole genome. This is just one, uh, uh, this is just, uh, not just one. This, there's, there, they sequence the genome in certain regions of your genome. And then they'll tell you information based on that, based on like eight ancestry, um, like your health and things like that. So CRISPR, I throw in CRISPR at usually at the end. I, it, it's again, this is this is a lot of information. CRISPR is a new technology again that I had to add into this PowerPoint because uh, it's new as in the sense of like we discovered it back I think early two thousand two, but we really didn't know a lot about it, and we really didn't, weren't able to sequence it and use it until a couple of years ago. And uh, what CRISPR is, is a, is an enzyme. Um, there's a, it's really complex, but there's an enzyme that can actually kind of find genes in your, or find uh, locations in your genome and cut those genes and then add certain sequences or change certain sequences or delete or insert a gene. Um, basically this is, this can kind of edit your genome and we didn't think this was going to be possible for a long time, but this is kind of like a, Oh my gosh, it's possible. And the really crazy thing is, it's really, really cheap. We didn't think it was going to be that cheap. Again, sorry for the announcements, guys. Um, so the uh, moving on from the genome, restriction enzymes is going to be a whole other kind of section of the, uh, the chapter. Um, restriction enzymes find specific sequences of DNA in a genome, and then they're going to cut the genome. You can see here it's the GAATTC. This is ECOR1, the enzyme. It's always going to find this sequence of nucleotides and cut in this specific manner. Now, 
there are a bunch of different restriction enzymes and they cut in a bunch of different ways. We call these two, we call these um, uh, sticky ends because then we can rebond them together using DNA ligase. When we call these blunt ends because they, they, they end in like, you can see they're just, a, it's a blunt end, there's just a, a cut there. All right, plasmids. Plasmids are uh, circular DNA found in prokaryotes. You can see here the prokaryote is going to have its original DNA, its genome, but then it also can have these plasmids. And we're going to be working a lot with plasmids when we do our bacterial transformation lab. Basically, what you do here is you look at where, this is again a plasmid, you look at where the, uh, the cuts are. You can see eco R1, we have uh, three cuts, one, two, three. BAM HI, we have two cuts, and then Hindi 3, we only have uh, one cut. So you can see here, we cut here, it means in for uh, the HIND3 restriction enzyme, our whole fragment is going to be 5,000. So think about this as a circle, you cut it once, you're going to have one fragment. If we cut this plasmid in three places, or for eco R1, you're going to have four, or I'm sorry, you're going to have three fragments, one, two, and three. You're going to have an 1100, a 750, and a thir or 3150 uh, base pair fragment. Same goes for BAMHI. We cut it twice. We're going to get two fragments here. But if we cut, or if we cut it in every single location, we add in all three restriction enzymes. We're going to cut it, and you can see, you can see, we have one, two, three, four, five, six different fragments there. Now, when going backwards, again, I'm not going to really be able to do this on the laptop here. But essentially, when you're uh, when you get this information, you have to kind of go backwards. You would have like an eco R1. You can see here we have 10, 30, and a 60. You'd cut it here maybe here and here, and you'd have the three different fragments and you just label the, the cuts. And then for Hindi 3, you only actually cut it once, so you just have one location. But when you add both of them together, you get a 10, 20, 30, and 40. What you have to do is you have to understand that the Hindi 3 is, between, is somewhere in, in the 60 because again, we have the 10, we already have the 30. When you cut 60 into 20 and 40, I mean, it, it equals out. So you have to put that, that the HIND3 uh, restriction enzyme in that 60 somewhere, so you get these different fragments. I'll show this in class. So again, um, beneficial, uh, sorry, recombinant DNA. This is, uh, this is essentially what the restriction enzymes allow us to do with these plasmids. We can actually insert DNA into a plasmid and give it to a bacteria cell. And this allows the bacteria cell then to produce that protein. Uh, you can see here we have this target gene. What's going to happen is we cut that gene and we cut it out, but then we can insert into a plasmid. Then that plasmid will produce that site or produce that gene that we want. Um, and it makes a protein. You can see here again, we have this target gene now in the plasmid. We can give that plasmid to the bacteria, and then that bacteria produces the protein. All right, moving on from uh, the restriction enzymes and bacterial transformation, uh, gel electrophoresis is when you have um, uh, th those, that DNA that's cut up. You can either do this with a eukaryotic or a prokaryotic cell. Basically, what happens is you have the uh, DNA placed in these wells. You send a electrophoresis a electric, I'm sorry, electronic or electric current through it. There we go. And uh, that separates the DNA based on the length. So what happens is you get one of these gel plates. So again, you put the plate or you put the uh, DNA in here and you send a current through it. And that, that will, again, it will separate the DNA based on the fragment length. Shorter fragments go further, longer fragments don't go as far. So you can see here, we have the wells here. They are going to separate separate, separate. These ones are the shortest. These ones are the longest. Oh, let's go back here. This is a pretty good, can I, is this animation going to go? Yep, yep, yep. Okay, so you can see the DNA, uh, again, the fragments are going to separate based on length. You can see the large ones don't go as far and the shorter ones go very far. Here's my analogy. If you're chasing a rabbit through a, um, a forest so, and you, you come across a bunch of jagger bushes, you're not going to be uh, able to go as far as the rabbit. So think the small rabbit can go further than you. It's bigger. You can also do this, then you can kind of go backwards with these gel plates. You can see where we have a 10, 30, 60, a 10, 20, 30, 40 for like our, this again, this is our last uh, problem that we did. You can get, essentially get that information from a gel plate then and just go back from the plasma. And again, I'll show this in class. More example problems, more example problems, not going to go over. All right, so what does that mean for, uh, for humans? So in humans, we have two things. We have STRs and we have VNTRs. These are short and longer uh, repeats of, you can see here, just like letters that we find in our genome. And uh, these are just repeats that we find randomly in people. So some people may have seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and they have just a different number of these repeats. 
So what happens is each person has a different number. That means that we have some uniqueness to our DNA. So what happens is, I keep on saying what happens. So what happens is, so what happens is uh, you can separate DNA based on these lengths. And then what uh, the scientists can do is they can identify like a DNA sample from your DNA. So uh, what we can get is stuff that looks like this, where you can identify crime scene DNA and kind of identify that a suspect was at the crime scene. Now, this doesn't 100% say, yes, this person was maybe like a murderer or something like that, but it says, hey, this person was at the crime scene, so we can at least say that they were there, um, which, again, raises the likelihood of maybe them being the criminal at that, at that, that location. Um, there's a couple of questions here that I'll go over, like a couple example um, problems, but uh, this is pretty basic. Now, the only thing that I add here is that... Um, you share the uh, you share these repeats from your parents. You again, you get them half from your dad, half from your mom. So you're gonna have half of them in general from each side. It's so gonna look a little bit like your mom's and a little bit like your dad's, um, but it's still unique to you um, because the likelihood of you having the same repeats as somebody else is like one in the billions, billions, and billions. All right, another thing that's uh, uh, that goes along with this again, if you find a small sample at a, uh, a, cr or a crime scene and you don't want to like just destroy it in just one uh, run of like a gel plate, um, you're gonna need a lot of the, the copies. So what happens is you can copy the DNA and you do it by PCR. It's called polymerase chain reaction, and this is just something that mimics replication. So you can take a small amount of DNA and very quickly get billions and billions of strands because there's a bunch of uh, just like the the enzymes and things that, that work within your cell in this machine. So this was created in the 1980s, um, and it's just how we replicate DNA. All right, GMOs. So editing the genome, we kind of talked about this with bacterial transformation, but editing the gem or genome of certain plants and, and organisms uh, can give them beneficial traits. Now, in the past, there's been a kind of push back against the GMOs just because um, uh, it's something new and anything that's new with new, de new technology can be looked at and kind of be nervous, you know, you know, with the vaccine, with COVID, people are kind of nervous just because it's so new, but um, tons of research has, has gone into GMOs. There is an ethical side of like, you know, with farmers and things like that, like, you know, having them, forcing them to buy these things because, you know, they can't outcompete with these major um, farming companies, but uh, GMOs are safe. Like there's, there's, there's tons of research on GMOs being safe. But basically what happens is you, take a gene from something else and you add it into a plant using these restriction enzymes and uh, the plant gains that new beneficial trait. All right, gene therapy. Uh, this is uh, when, again, this is a new biotechnology. This is when you have a, a virus and you almost kind of infect somebody with it, with this virus, but it's non-lethal or non, it's not going to cause like a major dis disease or disorder. And uh, you insert some gene that the person's lacking, so like cystic fibrosis, and that gene will then produce the right proteins for the person. And uh, it's just a new way of kind of inserting a gene um, into somebody and kind of getting it, you know, we're using that virus's, uh, you know, infectious capabilities and using it to our advantage. Stem cells. These are unspecialized cells that um, they're kind of, again, they, they result as a form of mitosis. When you get into like the really inner workings of mitosis, there's a lot more that goes on. But understand that these stem cells can help repair organisms, or uh, uh, not organisms, but um, uh, parts of an organism that maybe not or couldn't have been uh, like regenerated on their own. Um, these are, were again, kind of more, I want to say a hot topic issue back when, when I was in high school because they um, sometimes use uh, aborted fetuses back then. Now we have more technology and we can actually get, get these from other locations, so it's not that big of a deal. Um, but that was like kind of a really hot button issue back in the 90s and early 2000s. But now it's just, just because there's so many more things going on. This is kind of went to the wayside or with people being concerned about it. DNA cloning. So um, uh, this is just like having twins, but you do this with taking an egg, taking the nucleus out, adding in the nucleus into something else. And there you go. You have a clone of that, that organism. The first uh, vertebrate to be successfully cloned was Dolly the sheep. And uh, it only lived, it lived uh, a partial life because, again, there's some developmental things that go on there that just don't work right. Telomeres, these are the ends of the chromosomes that the um, DNA uh, is repeated. And it's actually kind of like, again, another uh, a section where you have your aglets of your shoes. It kind of protects the innermost important parts of your DNA. And um, this is, again, whenever your, whenever your cells replicate, they kind of shave off the ends. And so we see a trend of people with longer telomeres living longer and people with shorter telomeres having more genetic problems. 
Uh, vaccines. Uh, this is just one more uh, area. I think this is going to be our, our one of our last things we're going to talk about in this class. Um, vaccines are giving your uh, body a form of the virus or a spike protein of the virus. And your body uh, kind of mounts a small immune response to that. And it kind of recognizes that immune, that, 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 that virus. So you can have an immunity build up before you actually get the virus. And uh, I'll talk more in, in depth in class about this, but um, this is a very safe practice. Again, there's been a lot of studies with, with vaccines, saved countless lives, billions of people. The new mRNA vaccines though are kind of a little bit different. They uh, only inject mRNA. They don't actually inject the uh, virus. And this mRNA produces the spike protein, which the virus uh, uses to get into the cell. And so then your immune system can use that and uh, that, that spike protein and kind of create those antibodies before, uh, again, you get the, 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 um, the virus. Um, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine or mRNA, the Johnson & Johnson, which I'm getting on Sunday, is a, uh, it's called, an, I think, an attenuated virus uh, or vaccine, and that's a little bit different. Both are safe. And basically what this does is it allows us to build up immunity, and we have this thing called the herd immunity that uh, protects people. And you can see there might be some still infection with this herd immunity, but it greatly decreases the amount of transmission um, of the virus. So that's, I think, it. Yep. Mm -hmm.